Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Dr. Maureen Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Well, I'm excited about what I'm teaching on. I'm teaching about your faith will deliver the promises. And that's in the book of Colossians as we go through that book. Um, And I'm so excited because I've so wanted to teach on from this book, and now I get to. So just to give you a little bit of background on it, uh, Paul had never visited uh, that area, that church, and uh, but uh, the the person that did that did uh, live there and start the church, they believe was Pop Popferis, Popferis, okay, and uh, and so he he was running into problems because. False teachers came in, and they were preaching heresy. They were bringing in legalism, and they were bringing in humanism, and they were bringing in empty philosophies, and they were bringing in uh, uh, traditions, and they were bringing in the worship of angels, and they were taking the authority of that super uh, supreme authority of Christ Jesus, uh, drawing them away from that. And so... Anyway, and, you know, do we see that today? (laughs) Yes, same thing happened way back there. We can see happening many times in churches here. Now, we love the house of the Lord, but we need to keep it in what Christ has done. And so this letter, this letter speaks more about the importance of Christ than any other letter. Uh, Christ had made, uh, had, Christ had made all Christians uh, a part of the family and members of the household of God, equal in forgiveness and adoption. And uh, also that um, Christ is all that matters. That's what he was bringing out first and last. And therefore, contrary to the heresy, there was no special qualification or requirements to be saved and walk in the grace of God. And uh, so we can see that they were saying you got to add to it. And uh, then also that this, he's reminding them and uh, uh, in this book that Christ is the one who empowers us who renews us and who has our entire existence in Christ, that we have it all in him. He is all in all. And uh, that the devil and demonic activity is powerless. It's been defeated and uh, uh, through the cross of Calvary. And so we have that resurrection power in our lives now. And so this is Uh, what uh, Paul was writing to them about. But also in our own lives, we can see that people sometimes think the enemy has power. No, Jesus defeated him. He doesn't. So we don't chase demons. (laughs) Uh, We get it. We chase Jesus. We keep our eyes on him. We know that he's all powerful. We know that everything in the kingdom has already been given to us. It's already done. We're in the new covenant of grace. It's not something that we earn. It's something that Christ has already earned for us. And so we now are receivers of the new covenant. We believe in what Christ has done. And we allow ourselves to connect to what we already have. And then we let it let it flow through us to become a part of our lives that we see it in the visible, right? And uh, the old covenant, we've died to that. The old covenant makes you an earner. And so the, co- the old covenant's about you and, and God, and, it, and so in it, if you're perfect, everything goes great and wonderful, but if you miss the mark, which the Bible says we do miss the mark, then you're under a curse. But in the new covenant, you're only under blessings because Christ, Christ fulfilled the law, and he absorbed the curse, so you're not to have a life full of the curse, but you're to have a life full of the blessings. And so anyway... Last, last week, we started off talking about how Paul was in the grace of God ministering because grace is eternal encouragement. So he started out telling them how wonderful they were and how thankful he was to God for them. And then he began to tell them that he prayed for them all the time. 
and that he began to explain his prayers for them. And so we see there that he talks about that to have the knowledge of God's will for your life. And so that, and then to come into the wisdom of God and the spiritual understanding of, of God for your life. So he was praying that over their lives. And uh, so let's continue with the prayer that Paul was praying for them. And so it's Colossians 1.11. And so he was praying for them to live in the supernatural power that is already theirs, that they already have. Oh, my goodness. Do we embrace that? Do we acknowledge that resurrection power that is ours, that is able to produce what Christ has already given us in our own life? And so we need to focus on this. And so he said, I'm praying for this for you. And so the scripture reads this, strengthen with all might, he's praying for them, according to his glorious power. That is that word there is dunamis, resurrection power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. And what he was saying there is that, you know, the promises come by faith and patience. And the Bible tells us that uh, patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's a supernatural patience that we have. And that long suffering is, I like to, some translations calls it endurance. Endurance, that it's a power that we have in us that we don't quit. We take on that endurance that Christ has already given us. And uh, then, of course, we have the joy of the Lord with it all because we don't quit till we win. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so that's our determination. I don't know. This scripture here has just so spoken to my life, Philippians 2.13. You've heard me say it, but I like to say it again. Hallelujah. For it is not your strength, but it is God who uh, effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is to strengthen you to energize you, and to create in you the longing and the ability, hallelujah, to fulfill your purpose, which is his pleasure. Oh, my goodness. I mean, oh, that was such a scripture to me that I just hold on to now that I have more energy and more strength than I ever had in my life. I dealt with in my younger years, I dealt with chronic fatigue in my life, which I've been totally delivered and set free of it, because that's not God, because I'm under the blessings that by his stripes I was healed. But also, that in my family, we've been, we're more the couch potatoes, meaning that uh, energy was not our big thing. Now, you know, being married to Dr. Tom, he has supernatural energy. He has, he has enough energy for himself and for me. A matter of fact, he likes to do my jobs and always has. And so, and so I just say, hey, go do it, you know. But, <laughs> hallelujah. Uh, but anyway, so having that energy to run the race that God has for me, the passion that I want to, to run that race, and you have to have energy to run the race. And, uh, and so, I, you know, I don't know if you have, but I was looking in the wrong places for energy because I was looking to my own uh, physical body to produce the energy that I need. need to. I wasn't looking to, to that God provided that energy. I was like looking to myself and then I looked to others that like even like Dr. Tom and they have so much natural energy and then you, you kind of feel like I'm left out. Why you're so blessed. I wish I had that. And, uh, and I remember, I mean, I'm not the only one that has done this. So one time, years ago, I was in the health food store and Red Bull just came out. And it's a health food store. So I thought, oh my goodness, it's, it's just it's got this big sign that says energy. Oh. And you know, if you ever notice that on TV, everything that they're really recommending you to buy, they always say this will give you lots of energy. So apparently all of us are looking for more energy. And so I got that. And so I was just, you know, juggling it down. <laughs> and my, one of my sons said, Mom, do you realize what's in that? It's full of caffeine. 
and, and that's so unhealthy. And I thought, oh my goodness, I bought it at the health food store. How dare they sell that there? <laughs> but one, once I came into the covenant of grace, then God opened my eyes. See, grace just opens your eyes to revelation of what is in the word. And then I realized that I'm looking in the wrong directions. I need to look at the resurrection power that's already in me in the kingdom of God. And God says that he gives me his strength, his energy, and his creativity. Oh, my goodness. You know, uh, I needed all of those things, even the creativity, because in my life, being um, a mathematical person, uh, <laughs> that I needed to be able to, to get into that place of seeing of, of his creativity to build things. And so I just really say to you, uh, receive his energy and his strength to run the destiny God has for you. You already have it. He's already given it to you. Now you become that receiver. And it changed my life. I have so much energy today. I can say to Dr. Tom, no, I can do that now. Hallelujah. And so we're adjusting. Because <laughs> he so likes to take care of me, but I can do it. Hallelujah. Uh, he, and Colossians 1.11 says, this is another translation. I love this. For we, for we pray. This is Paul saying I was praying. For we pray that you would be energized. Say energized. With all explosive power. That's that resurrection power. From the realm of his magnificent glory. Filling you with great hope. Oh my goodness. That is God's hope. Now this is important. Because God's hope never disappoints you. God's hope is what we find that's the beginning of our faith. Now, faith is a substance of what? Things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. So hope is a hope that God gives us that tells us, this is what I have for you. But then you bring it into faith by seeing it done now. And But the word of God tells us in Romans, you hope. And until you get it, but once you get it, you don't have to hope for it anymore. Hallelujah. So we see this in the energy of God. We, it brings us into God hope for our lives. And we can dream with that hope. Then he goes on to, to say this, uh, Colossians 1.12 then he goes on to say, I'm praying this, giving thanks to the Father God who has qualified you to be partakers of the inheritance of what? The saints in light. Oh, my goodness. Why are you partakers? Because Jesus already bought it for you. So now you are partakers. And so we thank God for that. And so the Bible talks so much about being grateful and thankful. And not focusing on a negative, but let's focus on the good and be thankful and grateful to God about the good things that are going on in our life and what he's already given us. And those areas that we are fighting the good fight of faith is a good place to be thankful also because you're calling it already done. Because you have inherited, not alone, but with the saints that are in the light. And so the Bible tells us that we've been knitted together in love, that, we, that God has divine connections for us. That's why it's so important to be in church and, and, and allow God to bring those people into your life that he's called to be in your life to, uh, to now build together what God has for what he's called you to do. And so this is so important. And so we partake in our, in, within the saints. And But, you know, Dr. Tom was saying this was really powerful. So uh, when you choose to walk in love, love is a choice. And we have God's love in our life. It empowers us to be in the light because Christ is light and he is love. And so when I choose love, I have empowered the light. I've empowered what God has already given me. But if I choose hate, I've empowered darkness in my life. 
And so choice, we have a choice in this. To walk in the light, well, we have to walk in love then. Ooh, praise God, he's ministering right now. And th verse 13 and 14 says this, yes, praise God. He has delivered, then he goes on to say, I'm praying, and that, ye, that he, that is God, has delivered you from the power of darkness. What is he saying this to you? to you. The enemy is defeated. He did a complete work. Jesus defeated the enemy. So now he has empowered you, didn't it? That's what it says here. He has delivered you from the power of darkness. You are delivered from it. What does that mean to you right now? That means you are free from the curse. The curse should not be a part of your life. You're free from poverty. You're free from sickness. You're free from rejection. You're free from every negative thing that would come is not your inheritance. And he set you free from that. Oh, my goodness. But he brought you into what? He, he uh, conveyed you in, us into the kingdom of the son and of his love. And so I see it this way. You know, you're on the computer and you, you know, you have this column and you want to move this column over to this column. That's what God did. He took what you were over in this column in the kingdom of darkness and he transferred you, transformed you or transferred you into the kingdom of Jesus. Now you're in his kingdom, in the kingdom of God. Uh, one, he brought you in, one says brought, one says translated, one says transferred. And so these are all words that say you've been moved. Hallelujah. Not by what you do, but what Christ has done. And so he's praying for them to get this revelation now. The enemy is powerless. I'm praying that for you. And then he goes on to say, in whom we have redemption, uh, through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. So we know that by his blood now is perfect blood that he went into the holy of holies, put it on the mercy seat seven times, did a complete work, made a blood covenant with God that now the blood covenant is based on uh, what Christ has done. And I'm in Christ, but uh, when God looks at you, he sees you wrapped in Christ. Praise God. Well, let's go on now. Uh, now we're going to look at uh, uh, Jesus. When you see Jesus, you see the Father God. And so Colossians 1.15, he goes into this now. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, isn't he? The firstborn of all creation. So we want to talk about that image, that Jesus is the divine portrait of the true likeness of God. He's a divine portrait. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. And we see that in John 14, 9. It says this. Because Philip's saying, well, Jesus, show us the Father. And what does Jesus say? He says, have I been here with you so long, and yet you, you do not know me? Philip, he who sees me, seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So he's saying that, and uh, this is so important for us to grab now. So when I see Jesus in the four Gospels, I see the Father. So let's come into an understanding here. Now, we know that all scriptures are in are, are inspiration of God. They're inspired, right? Okay, and so let's see the mysteries that are hidden in the word. The first Adam was put on this earth to represent God to when they saw Adam, they would see who the father was. And he was here with, uh, with the authority that God had given him. Well, Adam gave it up to the devil. He forfeited. So what did he do? He gave up his authority, but he also gave up his representative of the father, the portrait of the father. Now, so we have to see this. Now, Father God has bound himself to his word. We know that in the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew, there is no permissive verbs, there's only causative verbs. So 
when you read the word in the Old Testament and God and Satan is a legalism, legalist, because the Bible says the power of sin or the strength of sin is the law. And so when it says God, God did this, God destroyed them, God did this, okay, it should say God allowed it. So uh, when you get born again, when you get spirit filled, when you get into the covenant of grace, then the mysteries of the word begins to unfold to you, and you find out this, that the Satan was representing God on this earth, but the second Adam, Jesus, came, and he showed us who the Father really is. So when I read the Old Testament, and when I say God did, I say God allowed, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when I read the Gospels and I see that Jesus went to the woman at the well, took a day to go to her that was married five times, living with um, uh, a man now, and Jesus went there to give her the Gospel, to give her value, to say, you're not worthless, you are valuable to Father God. So when I read that now, I see Father God went there. Why? Because I need to change the image inside of me. When I read the woman that was brought uh, to Jesus, uh, well, I was caught in adultery, and, and, uh, and, and they wanted to stone her, but then Jesus wrote on the ground, they all left, and he says, where is your accusers? She said, there is none. He says, I, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. That was Father God coming to her, speaking that. So I like to read that, and I like to now put Father God in there because I want to have the right image of my Father God, that he was a father full of love, he was a full of passion, he was a full of mercy, um, and uh, he loved us while we were yet sinners. And so we see the man that was full of demons, Jesus went there just to set him free so that he would not be tormented anymore but could live a life and life uh, that was full of abundance of God and be free from his prison. He, he healed the leopards. He didn't say to the leopards, you're not supposed to be in the crowd, but he healed them. He didn't condemn. He healed on the Sabbath day. He raised the dead. He fed the 5,000. So you go on and on and you read this. He, he opened the blind eyes. Uh, he healed and set free so many people. He had so much compassion, so much mercy, and that is he was displaying to us who the Father is, that all who came for healing, he healed them all. He delivered them from demons. He set the captives free. Oh, my goodness. Meditating on and seeing Father God in that place, seeing Father God there, ah, uh, just transformed your life into seeing God and being able to trust God with all your heart because you see who he really is. Oh, hallelujah. And so we see that Jesus said this, or Paul, I'm sorry. No, it was Luke. Praise, excuse me. Uh, Acts 138 says, Now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all that are oppressed by the devil because God was with him. So who had power? Who had the anointing? Was Father God there healing all that were oppressed by the enemy as Jesus allowed the Father to go forth in his life? He said, I only do what I see the Father do, and I only say what the Father says. Oh, my goodness. So getting that right image, but then we see in the word, uh, 2 Peter 1, 4, I think it is, that says that through his great and precious promises, we take on his divine nature and we escape the corruption of this world. So now people, <laughs> hallelujah, James says this, that when you read the word, well, I should read the scripture here, for anyone 
is a hearer of the word and not a doer, is a man that, that observes his natural face in a mirror. We look, when I look at the word, I see myself. Because as he is, so am I in this world. I live and move and have my being in him. And so I see myself, but a person that reads the word says, for, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he, he was. So if I read the word and then I just forget what I saw, <laughs> I, I don't allow who I just saw in the word to now flow out of my life that people, when they see me, they should see Jesus. Uh, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty continues in it, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in what he does. Oh, my goodness. When I look at the word, I need to see that I am merciful, that I have the divine nature of God, that I am loving, that I have the fruit of the Spirit, that I have the, uh, that I have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that I have the resurrection power in my life, that I, all the names of God have been given to me, and I see myself in the Word, and I know how to act, and I embrace that image that now I see. And when I go out for the day, I'm, everybody should be seeing Jesus. They should feel the love. You know, it was really interesting because this one place we go to breakfast, one morning as we went, um, the waitress was, was just really crabby. She was just ugly, crabby and ugly. All right, so she left the table, and uh, I said to Tom, she's going through something. We need to pray for her. So we prayed for her right away. And when she came back, we just I asked her if she was okay, and she said, no, I'm not feeling up to par today. And so we were just kind and we were loving to her. And uh, we said good words of encouragement because grace and courage. So we allowed the love of God to flow out of us. And uh, then we gave her a big tip. Now, every time I go in there, she just lights up. And we have a relationship because the mercy of God, the love of God touched her that day. And uh, that's what God wants. Oh, my goodness. We need to end right here. I, I hope this is blessing you. And you have an assignment now. You need to read the gospel, seeing, seeing now a Father God in those places that uh, Jesus did. And allow that image to grow in you. Repeat after me. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me my sins. And I ask your son Jesus Come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name.